Okay, good morning. And welcome to the City Council's fourth day of hearings on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2019. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the Finance Committee. We are joined by the Committee on Criminal Justice, chaired by my colleague, Council Member Keith Powers. And we have been joined today by Council Member Bob Holden, Council Member uh, Alika Samuels, and Council Member Barry Gudenchik as well. And uh, today we will hear the Department of Correction. Before uh, we begin, I'd like to thank the Finance Division staff for putting this hearing together, including the Director Latanya McKinney, uh, Committee Council Rebecca Chasen, Deputy Directors Regina Pareda Ryan and Nathan Toth, Unit Head Isha Wright, Finance Analyst Jin Lee, and the Finance Division Administrative Support Unit Nicole Anderson, Maria Pagan, Roberta Caterano, uh, who pull everything together. Thank you all for your efforts. I'd also like to remind everyone that the public will be invited to testify on the last day of budget hearings on May 24th, beginning at approximately 4 p.m. in this room. For members of the public who wish to testify but cannot attend the hearing, you can email your testimony to the Finance Division at financetestimony at council.nyc.gov and the staff will make it part of the official record. The Department of Corrections Fiscal 2019 Executive Budget totals $1.4 billion, which includes $17.5 million in new needs since the preliminary budget. Today, I'd like to focus on a number of items that DOC has said would accomplish, or which the state has said it must accomplish, but which the council feels the department does not have a well-defined strategy to complete. First is one of the major initiatives in the city that is impacting DOC's budget, which is Raise the Age, the plan to raise the age of criminal responsibility to 18 years of age and to provide 16 and 17-year-old justice-involved youth with age-appropriate housing and programming. The executive plan adds $9.8 million in fiscal 2019 $13.1 million in fiscal 2020, and $3.3 million in fiscal 2021 for Raise the Age, as well as 159 uniform positions. Given that youth need to be off Rikers Island by October 1st, the Council is extremely interested in learning more specific details about how the Department intends to meet that deadline, as from our perspective, the plan is not yet clear or solidified. Second, the budget shows a $55.7 million and 698 headcount decrease due to the planned summer 2018 closure of the GMDC facility on Rikers. As with Raise the Age, we have, impending, we have an impending deadline without a clear plan, plan for carrying out the directive. The Council is concerned that DOC will not be able to close GMDC by the end of the summer but we hope to hear testimony today about the steps DOC is taking to achieve this aggressive timeline that might allay those fears. Last is the issue of hiring delays. DOC has accounted for $27.7 million savings in fiscal 2019 as a result of hiring accruals for vacant civilian positions. Year after year, the Department is unable to fill its budgeted civilian headcount but the Council has yet to see a serious plan from the agency to address this long-standing issue. Before we begin, I'd like to remind my colleagues that the first round of questions for the agency will be limited to three minutes per Council member, and if Council members have additional questions, we will have a second round of questions at two minutes per Council member. I now turn the mic over to my co-chair, Council Member Powers, and then we will hear testimony from the Commissioner of the Department of Correction, Cynthia Braun, uh, after she is sworn in by council. Thank you and good morning everybody and thank you for being here and I have to give a very uh, big shout out to the chair of the finance committee Danny Drum, who has, to, has been here and been sitting through every single hearing including this one and, and many more ahead so thank you for for those uh, comments. My name is Keith Powers. I'm the chair of the committee on criminal justice. Pleased to join uh, my colleagues and chair of the Finance Committee, Danny Drum, uh, for today's fiscal 2019 executive budget hearing to review the Department of Corrections budget. Since we had our hearing in March, a lot has happened. Uh, the fiscal 2018-2019 state, state budget included design-build legislation to expedite the construction of new jails to replace Rikers Island. 
On April 5th, the Independent Commission on New York City Criminal Justice and Incarceration Reform released their follow-up report, commonly known as the Littman Commission, a more just New York City one year forward uh, that states that Rikers Island jails could be shut and replaced with borough facilities by 2024, three years sooner than the original projection. We also released our fiscal 2019 preliminary budget response with recommendations to create additional units of appropriations for the department. And because it was unclear of how much of the state's $100 million to implement raise the aid age would be for New York City, we called on the administration to add the appropriate funding to implement raise the age. Uh, the department also announced the unveiling of its first ever housing area exclusively for military veterans. And the city also announced that the DOC will house inmates consistent with their gender identity. Additionally, the city announced the launch of a new online bail payment system to make it easier for New Yorkers to pay bail. And the department also launched free express visitor bus services to Rikers Island. And uh, most recently, on April 23rd, this committee held an oversight hearing on safety and security in DOC facilities. And I, uh, and I should also mention, I think uh, just two weeks ago, that, or last week, the department also uh, open its a new library uh, at the Manhattan Detention Facility, and I'm sure you there's many more that I missed, and you can make note of. Um, w these are all positive steps in reforming and modernizing the criminal justice system. Uh, I and I think others are certainly excited by these changes, but also recognize that there is tremendous work ahead of us. The department's fiscal 2019 executive budget totals $1.4 billion, a decrease of approximately $42.6 million last year. The department's headcount totals 12,499 with 10,226 uniform positions and 2,273 civilian positions for fiscal 2019. As mentioned, the decrease is largely driven by the closing of GMDC. Um, uh, the expense budget act adds in new, uh, new funding for a compliance and safety center, an invest investigations division, and the expansion of the emergency services unit. Um, the, the DOC's budget also includes $9.8 million in fiscal 19, in 2019, $13. million in fiscal 2020, and $3.3 million in fiscal 2021 to implement Raise the Age, which we will talk about. The funding for this is coming from city tax levy, but the city also needs the state, state's contribution in order to safely and adequately implement the legislation. The, the department's capital plan does not have any new additions to the plan, but does separate out the $1.1 billion for new jails over the two fiscal years, something that the council has uh, asked for. And although we did call for this in our budget response, it does not have additional units of appropriation that the council has asked for for the department and other agencies to give us a clear understanding of how money is being spent for different uh, capital items. Mm -hmm. Um, so we will hopefully, as we get to the adopted budget and fo moving forward, we'll continue to see more units of appropriation to give us a clear understanding of how money is being spent. With all of that, uh, we're looking forward to hearing more from the department. We thank you for being here. I just wanted to thank, thank you quickly the folks from the Finance Committee, Jin Lee, uh, Aisha Wright, Josh Kingley, Kingsley, Will Hongyak, and then of course my staff, Abigail Bessler and Emily Wal Walsh, who have helped to put this, uh, put this hearing together and have helped us work through the uh, budget process to date. Um, I'd also like to welcome and thank uh, Commissioner Brand and her staff and all the folks who are working at the department for the work that they do every day. I've said this in the past, but I think we all know how challenging the, the job is every single day. And, uh, and certainly um, we, we, we know that your role is critical in both the closing of Rikers Island, but also all the work that we have to do to make sure that people are safe and secure every single day. So thank you for being here. And with that, I'll hand it back over to the chair. Thank you very much. And I'm going to ask council to swear in the panel. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to mention that we've also been joined by council member Cohen. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. Okay, please begin. Good morning, Chair Powers, Chair Drum, members of the Committee on Criminal Justice and members of the Committee on Finance. I'm Cynthia Brand, the Commissioner of the Department of Correction. My colleagues and I are here today to discuss the executive budget for fiscal year 2019. The budget reflects the Department's priorities as we move forward with our reform agenda. 
Our goal is to make our department a national leader in corrections and establish procedures for long-term long success. As we discussed at the March hearing on the preliminary budget and the hearing on safety in the jails last month, the department has achieved success in key areas, including all categories of inmate on inmate violence. We continue to take a holistic approach to reducing incidents. Since we have had the most success in the areas where we focus the most attention and resources, we use those lessons learned to build on and expand our effective reforms to broader populations. Since fiscal year 14, we have seen promising improvements in the incident levels, particularly those involving some of the most vulnerable or problematic populations. In the first three quarters of fiscal year 18, inmate fights have decreased by 6.4%. Serious injuries to inmates resulting from fights or assaults have decreased by 14%, and stabbings and slashings have decreased by 41%. In specialized units such as CAPS and PACE, ESH, Enhanced, Enhanced Supervision Housing, and the Secure Unit, and our restarted general population units, we have seen reduced violence and increased program participation. The last Federal Monitor's report praised us for being compliant with 78% of the 313 individual stipulations of the consent judgment. This is a testament to the hard work we have accomplished since the end of 2015. While this is encouraging, our goal is to achieve and sustain 100% compliance with the entire order and have the court release us from further obligation. I have the utmost confidence that we will achieve that goal. Also noted in the report, we continue to be challenged by the number of uses of force. We work closely with the monitoring team to implement important changes, including providing comprehensive training to all staff that includes defensive tactics, understanding the revised use of force policy, conflict resolution, and de-escalation techniques. This curriculum goes well above and beyond the requirement of the consent judgment, and we believe that once staff have completed the training, it will yield a change in our overall need to use force and then see significant reductions in assault on staff, inmate fights, and other violence indicators. In response to the monitor's report and our own concerns, we implemented a use of force improvement action plan. This plan includes deploying de-escalation teams, enhancing the collection of gang intelligence to prevent the occurrence of violence, which may require the use of force, increasing real-time video monitoring and analysis including the opening of the Compliance and Safety Center, redesigning the agency's rapid review process so that we can quickly identify any unusual or problematic incidents, and assigning mentoring captains to the facilities to provide staff and with support and on-site training. We launched this plan a few weeks ago and have already seen successes and are optimistic that it will lead to improvements in both the quantity and quality of our use of force. Reducing violence and keeping our staff safe requires a holistic approach to management. Every service and program we expand creates a better environment, which helps reduce violence in custody and prepare people to be more successful when they return to our communities. Under this administration, we have expanded programming to five hours per day, restructured our custody management system, increased the number of hard and soft skills vocational training, and incorporated programming that is responsive to specific populations, such as those with mental health challenges, young people, women, and the persistently violent. We are not done. Since our last budget hearing in March, we have opened a dedicated New York Public Library location at MDC, which is the second in the department. We've launched visitor shuttles from Manhattan and Brooklyn, making it easier for those in custody to maintain meaningful relationships with their families and friends something that is critical to success. We've held a family visit at the Children's Museum in Manhattan and started an online bail payment system, one of the first in the country, to make it easier for people to pay bail. Culture change takes time, particularly in an agency as vast and complicated as corrections. While we have experienced successes in many areas, there's still work to be done. We are confident that our achievements over the last few years prepares us for continued success in fiscal year 19 and beyond. Success is never achieved in a vacuum. I thank the mayor and the members of the city council for your continued support as we carry out our mission. 
Your support of our staff and the very difficult work they do every day is clearly reflected in the executive budgets of this administration, and it is very much appreciated. Some highlights of the fiscal year 19 executive budget include funding for 71 additional civilian positions for our investigations division, raise the age implementation, new and improved cell doors, and areas of the use of force improvement action plan, such as the facility-based emergency services unit teams, and the Compliance and Safety Center. The Department's fiscal year 2009 expense budget is $1.4 billion. The vast majority of this, 88%, is allocated for personal services and 12% for other than personal services. Fiscal year 2019 budget is $20 million less than this year's budget of $1.42 billion. This decrease in funding is mainly from uniform headcount reduction due to the closure of the George Mochin Detention Center on Rikers Island, which takes a full effect in fiscal year 2019. Included in the budget are decreases of $28 million in fiscal year 2018 and $2.6 million in fiscal year 19, and increases of $24 million in fiscal year 2020, $14 million in fiscal year 2021, and $10.7 million in fiscal year 2022 in the out years. The following is an overview of the major changes that were included in the department's budget. Personal services accrual, a reduction to DOC's full-time salary budget of $28.8 million in fiscal year 18, $27.7 million in fiscal year 19 to, due to hiring less corrections officers than anticipated in May 2017 and November 2017 classes. Citywide savings initiatives developed by OMB resulted in a reduction of 192,000 in fiscal year 18, 1.3 million in 19, 1.5 million in 20, and 1.7 million beginning annually in fiscal year 2020. Reforms that will result in budgetary efficiencies are anticipated to be developed through reviews of citywide phone plans by DOIT stricter adherence to civilian overtime policies and procedures, transition to battery-powered electric vehicles, and automated enhancement to the city's procurement processes. To further enable the department to satisfy requirements within the Nunez consent decree specific to the use of force, a total of 3.4 million in FY19 and 4.9 million beginning annually in FY20 was funded to support an additional 71 investigator positions. To enhance staff and inmate safety and security at RNDC, $5.6 million in FY19 was provided for the replacement of all sliding cell doors with hinged, tamper-proof cell doors. To ensure compliance with the New York State Commission of Correction and New York State Office of Children and Family Services standards during the transition of 16- and 17-year-old inmates from DOC to ACS custody, $9.9 .9 million in FY19 assumes nine months, $13.1 million in FY20 assumes a full year value, and $3.3 .3 million in FY21 assumes only three months for 159 uniform positions to staff the Horizon facility for two full calendar years. To provide additional emergency response patrol units during our most active and violence-prone shifts at our high-risk facilities, 3.6 million beginning annually in FY19 for 45 uniform positions was also funded. On January 31st, DOC opened the Compliance and Safety Center, housing the department's compliance and video monitoring units and the new Emergency Operations Center. The CASC will serve as both an integrated command post to aid in the Department of Corrections rapid response effort to keep personnel and inmates safe in emergency situations and to strengthen compliance with correctional standards and protocols. An increase of 1.2 million in FY18 and 4.9 million beginning annually in FY19 for 55 uniform positions has been provided to support the operations of the center. With regard to capital funding, fiscal year 19 capital budget and commitment plan, no additional funding was provided. The plan totals 2.1 billion, which covers fiscal years 18 through 22. The department continues to hire corrections officers at historic levels. Most recently, 856 corrections officer recruits were hired in January 2018 and are presently undergoing intensive training to prepare for graduation next month. 
This new academy, along with the 5,700 hired since May 2014, have enabled us to enact the reforms necessary to provide a safer and better environment for our staff and inmates. With the graduation of the current academy class in combination with the closure of GMDC, fiscal year 19 will be the first year we will be fully staffed in our jails since our reform agenda began in 2015. This will also yield a further decrease in overtime costs and allow for more efficient use of our resources. To date, we have been able to reduce our uniform overtime spending from $240.4 million in fiscal year 17 to a projected $196.6 million in fiscal year 18. This anticipated 18% reduction in uniform overtime represents the Department's commitment to bringing our overtime costs down. As posts are filled with new full-time hires, the Department will be able to reduce overtime reliance to achieve the $150.4 million uniform overtime budget in fiscal year 19. The following is a summary of the changes to the Department's civilian and uniform, uniform authorized staffing levels included in the executive plan. The civilian authorized full-time headcount is 2,195 in fiscal year 18 and 2,273 beginning annually in fiscal year 19. The authorized headcount increases from 18 to 19 is due newly, to newly funded initiatives that will not begin until FY19. The uniform authorized headcount is 10,427 in 2018, 10,226 in fiscal year 19, 10,242 in fiscal year 20 and 21, and 10,083 beginning annually in fiscal year 22. The authorized uniform headcount decreases from fiscal year 18 to 19 due to the closure of GMDC, Will take, which takes full effect in FY 2019. However, that decrease is offset by uniform headcount increases included in the fiscal year 2019 executive budget for the staffing of the Horizon Detention Facility, Compliance and Safety Center, and the Emergency Services Unit. The average uniform headcount is estimated to be 10,695 in fiscal year 2018, which represents an increase of 807 compared to an average of 9,888 in fiscal year 17. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify and for your continued support. We're happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. And uh, let me just start off with just something I noticed in your testimony on page four regarding headcount. You mentioned that you're going to have a graduation next month. And I'm wondering if you've ever had council members come and speak at those graduations? We have had council members attend but have not requested to speak, but we are more than willing to fit anyone into the program who wishes to do so. Okay. So we look forward to getting that invitation and hopefully we'll be able to make it and have an opportunity to address the correction officers as they come out of the academy. I've done that with uh, the NYPD, so I think it would be a great addition to do it with uh, correction as well. We welcome you. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. All right, now, uh, units of appropriation. The Council's preliminary budget response called for a number of agencies to create new unit of, units of appropriation. DOC's budget is comprised of seven program areas, but only has four U of A's. What is your assessment of how creating new U of A's to match program areas would improve DOC's overall budget structure? Good morning. Thank you for the question. The department is committed to working with the council and OMB to create greater transparency in the department's budget. So we're happy to work with you both during the executive, um, I'm sorry, adopted budget process or further to create um, units of appropriation that properly and clearly reflect our spending. So you're having discussions with OMB now? Yes. Okay, good. Because that is a priority for the council. Uh, the department has budgeted civilian headcount of 2,273 in the fiscal 2019 executive budget, but historical actual headcount tells us the department is consistently under budgeted civilian headcount. For example, in fiscal 2017, the department budgeted 2,182 civilian positions, but the actual headcount was 1,729. That is 453 below the budgeted civilian headcount. Uh, what is the department's strategy for hiring up to the budgeted headcount going forward. Thank you for the question. A 
as you accurately reflect uh, our headcount and civilian headcount, um, we have a number of vacancies. Uh, that is due to uh, several reasons. The first is we have several hard to fill titles, um, which we actively recruit and try to fill um, at the agency, but um, historically have, have had a hard time filling. And what are those? Investigators, um, <laughs> information technology, construction, trades titles. Um, we also have um, a high turnover, a high turnover due to the um, location of Rikers Island and gaining access. So um, what we typically experience is um, that individuals that we hire, once they um, get familiar with the commute to Rikers and having to work inside of a jail environment, we have a, a high turnover. Also linked to that uh, high turnover is the same commute and access to Rikers Island um, as it relates to the salary. So the salary is the same for the in inconvenience of having to work in a jail setting or coming to Rikers Island. Um, but as I mentioned before, we are actively um, recruiting and trying to um, fill those hard to fill titles. So that seems to be more a problem with retention than recruiting from what you're describing. Well, the, the recruiting um, is impacted up front with the salary and having to come to Rikers Island. Um, so can you tell me how you do recruitment for these positions? How do you go out and try to find people? We use the um, posting, citywide postings. Um, we, um, career fairs, we have recruitment unit both. And we pull from our, um, the established list uh, hiring pools. Do you ever go to community fairs or events like that within the community to advertise the positions? We do through our recruitment unit, yes, and our uh, human resources department. One of the things that I found with the school crossing guards with the NYPD is that um, they were only recruiting like in police precincts. So um, I hope that with these efforts that you're making into the community, that you're doing a wider expansion than that. I mean, because how many people went into police precincts, you know? So the same question I think, you know, would apply here in terms of making sure that you do that outreach extensively. Yes, Council Member uh, Drum, we, in 2017, uh, our recruitment division attended 508 recruiting events and a significant uh, portion. How many? 508, um, and those are both at um, uh, in community um, centers, uh, college or um, educational settings, they are career fairs um, and other, lo other um, directed uh, locations um, uh, at, at malls and other events. We also do a targeted attempt to uh, get diversity and so um, up to 15% of those 500, and, um, uh, 500 uh, in events were diversity driven as well. Okay, good, so um, what type of an impact does um, you know being under the budgeted civilian headcount have on the department's budget? Being under headcount has resulted in a re greater reliance on overtime expenditures. But as we move forward to fill um, civilian positions, we hope to reduce the reliance on on overtime as a result. On We've overtime. also had some major initiatives that had warranted um, additional increased uh, overtime spending. So for the trades title, the example, camera installation throughout our facilities. So now that that project has concluded, we would see those expenditures no, no more in our budget because that project has, has been completed. Okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Raise the Age. The executive budget includes funding to implement Raise the Age over the course of two calendar years. Is the department on track to uh, transfer adolescents into ACS custody? Yes, we are, and we are committed to meeting that deadline, and we're working closely with ACS uh, to, to, concrete, um, to make a concrete plan to make that happen. And how many adolescents are currently on Rikers? As of today, um, adolescent males are total 98, and females are three. So Raise the Age legislation was enacted in 2017, and there has been planning underway since then. Adolescents are currently in DOC custody, but we still see adolescent custody transition into AS, ACS custody. 
The law mandates this, but uh, why is DOC providing temporary security at juvenile facilities for approximately two years? So the heart of my question is really the idea with moving them off of Rikers was to get them away from a jail environment. If you're still having corrections officers at the other facilities, it's still creating a jail environment. So why is that in the budget for two years moving forward? Thank you for the question. I think as, as you indicated in your question, uh, the law specifically provides that ACS in conjunction with the Department of Correction will jointly manage those 16 and 17 year olds who are currently in um, the Department of Corrections custody located in Rikers Island and who will move off Rikers Island as of October 1st. And so by law, we've been directed to uh, jointly manage that population um, for that period of time. I think uh, Chief Canty can discuss um, the department's anticipated role and um, certainly the detention center will be a secure detention center um, and not a jail located on Rikers Island, but the department's um, custodial responsibilities um, remain as ACS already has custodial responsibilities, our functions will be very similar. So the corrections officers will always be in the um, adolescent facilities? No, no, the expectation is that um, correction officers um, will have a role initially at the ACS facility and as ACS um, ramps up their hiring, um, the role of New York City correction officers will diminish. Okay, and then what type of training are they getting for this transition? We are currently working with uh, OLR and um, the collective bargaining units to um, assess that. And will that include some child psycho psychologist or child psychology type training? Um, all of those plans, the transition and what that training will require is under um, consideration and we're working with the union and the Office of Labor Relations to work those things, issues out. Okay, because I certainly hope so. That is part of the, the reason I think why we're moving them off of Rikers is to um, treat them in a, uh, in a better way. Um, so the, the, the full timeline for the transition um, is, is how long, two years? So the funding and the positions we have in the uh, executive budget spans two calendar years. That's why they're proportionally um, in fiscal year 19 for a full year value in 20 and then a uh, three month value in 21. So we anticipate it'll take those two years for our correction officers to be within um, the facility while ACS hires up. Okay, so uh, the DOC is anticipating a minimum staffing level of one officer for every six adolescents. What's the current correction officer uh, to adolescent ratio? The current staffing is 1 to 15. 1 to 15? Yes, sir. So that is a, a major improvement of going down to 1 to 6, and that will be implemented within the two years, or will that be implemented immediately? Immediate. That is immediately, sir. Immediate? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, are the 159 correction officers scheduled to be assigned at Horizon Juvenile Center undergoing specialized training? Um, we, I think I asked that, um, and you're in negotiations about who will provide that training. Um, we are in negotiations as to what will be encompassed in that training, yes. Okay. Um, of the total number of adolescents in DOC custody, how many have been identified as LGBTQ? I don't believe we have that number for you, but we can get that to you by the end of the day. Do you collect that data? Uh, we collect the data if they self-identify. We don't require them to disclose, so if they self-identify, we would have that. Oh, that's good. Okay, the East River Academy serves students between the ages of 16 and 21 in multiple locations on Rikers Island. I think you know I was a New York City public school teacher for 25 years, so education is important to me. Uh, with Raise the Age implementation, uh, is DOC in conversation with the DOE and ACS regarding how best to move forward with um, the education for this adolescent, adolescent population. Yes, that is a part of the transition from Rikers to um, Horizons. And um, I know on Rikers, I, I, and, 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 and subsequently I've met with the, um, the director, I guess, and the principal um, from the academy as well. Um, will those teachers then be assigned to Horizon? 
How would that work? Those details haven't been um, agreed on yet, but we're working on a plan that will make the transition easy and, and have the youth be successful in their education. No um, detainee on Rikers Island. I, in the school, I mean, it's a question I've always been meaning to ask. Um, in the school, are, are teachers able to access internet to use like a, a, a whiteboard or a, um, yes. uh, to, to pull up you know, a video or something? Yes. I'm told the answer to all your questions is yes. Yes. Um, are um, those classrooms eligible for capital funds from the class, from the, from the council? In other words, sometimes we give capital funding to schools in our, in our districts and uh, they provide things, you know, as, such as those, um, they're not called whiteboards, they're called um, smart, smart boards, smart, smart boards. Uh, and I'm wondering if that is something that might be a need uh, in the school. Uh, we already have smart boards, sir, but we're willing to take some more if you'd like to give us. <laughs> we know you need more capital funding, but uh, I'm trying to be a little generous here. All right, uh, the uh, executive capital commitment plan modifies the $1.1 billion for new jails by spreading the funding across two fiscal years with $300 million in fiscal 2019 and $765.6 million in fiscal 2020. We understand that we'll see an improved allocation of funds once once the CPSD study is done, but uh, how did DOC arrive at this plan and spreading the funding across two final years? So we took the feedback from the council in the prelim hearing very seriously, and we had discussions with OMB regarding um, taking the funding, the 1.1 billion out of fiscal year 18 and reallocating it. So the thought was to uh, allocate resources in fiscal year 19 that we would hope could be applied to a design contract by the end of the fiscal year. Along, you know, the CPSC study concludes, the, the ULERP concludes, um, that was the kind of the timeline we were moving on. And then for fiscal year 2020, the remainder of those available funds available for con construction. Okay. Um, let me talk a little bit about closing Rikers. The city has set out a 10 year goal according to the roadmap to closing Rikers Island, which indicates major milestones that the city plans to reach in order to close Rikers Island. We saw a couple of new needs in the preliminary financial plan as a result of adding new initiatives from the roadmap. Uh, are there additional new needs that we will see uh, going forward? Um, at this time, we feel all the needs and priorities that we had to achieve swiftly have been funded, and we also look to when we can um, internally fund as much as possible. Is there anything on DOC's budget that could be repurposed to meet the needs of the roadmap's goals instead of adding new funding? We continually evaluate that as, as the plan moves forward, so I couldn't give you a definitive answer right now, but that is always a part of uh, the analysis we do is how much can we um, take care of internally. Okay, one of the goals of, um, from the roadmap is to complete um, uh, renovations of the existing facilities on and off Rikers. Uh, we see fiscal uh, 2019 executive budget funding to replace cell doors at RD, R RNDC. How many facilities other than RNDC are due for renovations and what is the estimated cost for renovations to facilities on Rikers Island? There are several facilities on Rikers Island that are, are in need of state of good repair. Um, work such as roof replacements, HVAC upgrades, cell doors. Um, I don't have I, I don't have quantified in front of me by facility that information, but we can certainly follow up with you on that. So, in one of my visits to uh, Rikers, I forget which building it was, but on actually on numerous visits, I would walk down um, the hallway, and um, every 10 feet or so, there were buckets placed to uh, absorb the water to hold the water dripping, what buildings is, are you going to do the roof repairs in? I, I'm assuming that that was the issue, was that it was rainwater or leakage from the roof coming in. Um, again, I, I apologize, I don't have the specified list, but we can certainly follow up with you on that as to where the roof replacements are, the HVAC, um, all those itemized. Do you know if that uh, roof repair work that you're going to do would cover all of the buildings that have this um, problem? That would be the goal. 
And that would be the goal? Yes. But you don't know if that's included in the, in the budget? The um, current facilities um, were all, um, at the time, um, post-Sandy. So um, going forward, obviously, um, maintaining the buildings in a state of good repair is an ongoing um, effort. So um, as Actually, what I saw was pre-Sandy. So these conditions have been there for a very long period of time. So I think I visited there in 2010 when I first saw it. So this has been a long time coming. So I really would like to get those answers. Okay. We'll get them to you, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, transgender housing unit. I'm going to turn it over to my co-chair. Uh, the mayor and the department recently announced that DOC will house inmates consistent with their gender identity, and that DOC is working with the Commission on Human Rights to maintain the transgender housing unit as an additional safe housing option for transgender inmates. How many corrections officers are currently assigned to the transgender housing unit, and what is the plan for staffing going forward? Um, currently, the transgender unit is in operation and will remain so. The department is working uh, with the City Human Rights to develop a plan on how we will accomplish this. Uh, we will have, we have currently a full staffing plan for the transgender unit. They don't have a separate staffing plan in any other housing unit. Um, and we will maintain a, a safe staffing plan as we move forward. Okay, and uh, is the CPSD study for the new jails looking into the needs of LGBT um, detainees? Um, yes, and we can include that in, in our discussions with all as we move forward. Okay, that also, as you know, is an extremely important issue to me as well. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. All right, Chair uh, Powers. Yes. Thank you. And I want to note that we've been joined by Councilmember Lansman, uh, Councilmember Cumbo, Councilmember Van Bramer, Councilmember Moya, and, I, and Councilmember Gibson was here and had to, had to leave. So thank you all for joining us. I had a couple of follow-up questions from Chair Drum. The first one being on the cell doors. Are there other facilities that need beyond beyond uh, RNDC that need cell cell door upgrades? If so, are we planning for them? Is there is there a cost to those? There are other facilities um, on Rikers Island that have the rail and rack sliding doors. The replacement doors that we're putting in at RNDC are um, swing doors. Um, tamper-proof swing doors, and so it's a different type of technology. The rail and rack sliding doors, um, I know, uh, exist at AMKC and EMTC, but as we move to um, close Rikers and um, move into community-based facilities, we are um, considering where, um, where the needs um, for uh, that kind of funding to replace those doors at that expense is necessary. RNDC is, um, as you're aware, a facility that has uh, the East River Academy, the largest um, uh, school space plus the additional recreation and programming space that we've been using for the 16 and 17 year olds and as we close GMDC a significant number of our um, young adult population we uh, intend to move into RNDC because of the availability of those program space schools and services that's why RNDC the investment um, in the doors there uh, right now for us makes sense with respect to the consideration of the uh, other facilities that may have those doors it'll depend on um, as we look as we move forward and, and uh, close close facilities, which facilities have a need to remain open the longest. So just to clarify, is the answer that yes, some do, could, yes. do need it? Yes. yes, some do. Is there a reason we're not replacing those cell doors? Is, I think your part is about the closing closing of the long-term plan, to, you know, longer-term plan to close Rikers Island. But what, what are the other facilities that would need it? You need, I think so it's not that they would need it. It's that AMTC and EMTC, I know, are two facilities that have, um, Same type of door have, have those that. types of doors. Okay. Um, uh, GMDC has those types of doors as uh, well, but we're closing GMDC um, this summer. So the doors themselves, as the Nunez Independent Monitor issued a report um, this spring, the doors themselves are, are um, uh, standard um, in, in many correctional settings, and they're not inherently unsafe. Um, the department has systems and processes and procedures in place to um, monitor um, the functioning of those doors and ensure that the doors, when they are um, not operable or not functioning properly, aren't in use and then to make necessary repairs. Um, but they are old doors. Our facilities are old, which is, is 
you know, part of why newer facilities would um, be better. And in, just, in uh, just a follow-up question: with the what, what's it, what would be the timeline to replace the doors at RNDC once the money's into the budget? Like, how long will it take to replace them? And second, is I, I think the, I, the answer is no. But is anybody being is any were those cells that were found to be had malfunctioning cell doors? Those were taken offline in terms of holding people. In correct, way? correct. We have yeah. an automated um, tracking system for um, um, maintenance requests, and the doors, when they're identified, they're taken offline. Uh, individuals aren't um, housed in that cell, and the uh, door is either um, repaired and then put back online, or um, or remains offline. And in terms of the timeline, I think uh, for the replacement of the doors. So the funding's available in fiscal year 19, so we anticipate the project to be completed, although we're taking steps now to begin ordering and working with the vendor to get everything ready for delivery so we can begin the work July 1st. So when you say completed, what, when, if you, that money goes in July 1st, it, what's the anticipated completion date? For the completion date, um, that I don't have on me right now, but I can get back to you, but it will be done next fiscal year. In this fiscal year? Uh, 19, yes. Okay. Um, moving to raise the age, I know the, I know Council Member Drum covered some of this, so I wanted to just ask some follow-up questions on it. With the 159 correction officers that are going to be placed at Horizon, um, I, I don't know if you, I don't know if, and I'm sorry if it's repetitive, but I don't know if Councilor Drum um, uh, or got or that you guys had answered. Is the placement is 159 new officers new officers, or are they existing at other facilities that will be transferred there? And if so, what how are the how is that determination made about who, what facility they get placed at, and who goes to Horizon? Sorry, there's a requirement that um, those that go to work um, at the Horizons facility with the adolescents um, coming from Rikers Island have two, um, two, at least two years of experience working with um, this uh, 16 to 21 year old um, pop uh, aged population. And so that will drive in some part um, uh, who could be eligible, but um, they will come from existing staff and I'll defer to the first deputy commissioner with respect to how the staff will be identified. So the identification of the staff to be assigned at Horizon, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that part of the question. Yeah, the, the question is, how are you going to choose the 159 correction officers that are going to work at Horizon? And I think part of the answer is two, uh, there's a minimum requirement of two years history working with that population. So that means there, they'd be existing officers, I, I, you know, it sounds like for two years history. The question is beyond that, what are the other considerations, or how is the selection going to be going to be made about who leaves, you know, one facility and moves to the horizon? To horizon. Right. So the main consideration is um, officers who have um, already worked with that population um, at RNDC. Um, so we anticipate that um, of the staff that have either worked with the adolescent population or uh, have the required two years. Um, of working with the population will be able to staff uh, Horizon. How many officers are at RNDC right now? Approximately 760. Okay, so you have 760. So how do you get from seven? My, my question is really how do you have those 760 get to the 159? Uh, so some uh, population perhaps doesn't have the two-year experience requirement. Maybe maybe most do. I don't know. But the but the question is, how, what what are the what are the extra considerations? Is it interest level? Is it experience level? Is it you know how are you how how does that determination made about who moves over? So as a as a result of the Nune, uh, Nunez consent decree, uh, we have been recruiting over the, the last four four years. Um, so all of the the great majority of staff who work at RNDC um, either have uh, prior experience or um, have expressed an interest in working with this population. So um, the staff that is currently at RNDC um, fits the criteria for Horizon. I think that's a different answer than I was asking. What I was really, I mean, the, the question is, is, is essentially you have 760 officers, so how are you going to, what is the criteria behind choosing the 159? That will end up a horizon. We know what the minimum standard would be, and I and I appreciate that. But it's just a, a, sec a second question, which is, what's the what's the uh, what are the additional considerations that are given 
This could, you know, and, and the point is that the, the purpose of the law with Raise the Age is to move them out of the correction facilities and put them in the custody of ACS. I understand the transition need of having 159 officers. The question is how are you going to choose that population noting that there's been a special consideration given to this age population. So not all of the 700 officers work with the adolescent population. There's an adult population in right, the facility right, right, as right, well. Right, right. So the number is much less. Um, so there is the experience requirement. There's also a seniority that we have to take into account when we're transferring new folks to new posts. So we're not only working um, within the agency, but we're also working with OLR and the unions to decide who that staff will be that goes over. So seniority can determine where you That's work. correct. And is, what about disciplinary records, use of force? How are those factored into? All of those are taken into consideration because we look at that because of the Nunez consent decree. And does that, does that is seniority placed before that in terms of a consideration? Meaning, does that, I mean, if I, if, what, how is that used? Like, how, how does your use of, or your disciplinary record, let's say, factor into a determination of whether you're placed with the 16 and 17 year old population? We do a holistic a review of the candidates who have, uh, who meet, you know, if there's uh, eligibility criteria for a particular post assignment, um, first meeting the eligibility criteria, which, um, and second um, would be, you know, looking at, looking at the person's employment um, history with us. And so that's um, how the assignments have been made for um, within the department, and that's how the assignments will be made here as well. And as the commissioner mentioned, there's obviously um, uh, use of force um, um, history and outcome um, uh, investigation, outcome determination uh, criteria that play a part in uh, assignment to specialized uh, populations and units. So that will be followed as well. And then, uh, okay, thank you, thank you for that. And when the, what happens after two years when it sounds, I think the answer was that after we're, we're budgeting, we're expecting two years for the 159 officers to be at Horizon. Is there a population that stays after that or do they, do they come back to existing facilities or do they get absorbed by ACS or what happens at that? Our officers would return to Rikers. Right, return to Rikers. Yes. Okay. So, okay, got it. Uh, moving to new jails, we are, I know that we covered some of this. There's a, the kind of current capital commitment plan is $1.1 billion for new jail facilities. What does that 1.1 cover? What is that, what is that amount? Well, why $1.1 billion of the total cost, which we know will be more than, more than that? So the $1.1 billion was just internally within our existing 10-year plan. Um, the reallocation of funding predominantly for the, what was the new 1,500 bed facility to be on Rikers Island, that takes up a large majority of that amount. And the remainder was associated with the capital projects that were slated for the borough facilities. And that, that's the... Um, so it's, it's, it's money that was committed for other projects in the past, so either the new facility, a new facility on Rikers Island, or capital upgrades at right. existing facilities that was rolled in. So it's, it's repurposed, I mean, it's essentially repurposed yes. money for the... And uh, got it. And I know there's an the ongoing study from Perkins Eastman around, they were hired as the official consultant for the project. Is there any, any preliminary findings from them so far from their study? And then what's the expected timeline when they release it? The expected timeline for release would be the end of this calendar year. Um, workshops and studies are ongoing. I believe um, community engagement is anticipated to be to begin soon. And last month, um, the task order was released for the envir environmental impact study to begin as part of the ULERT process. So the EIS will be real, will, will start? The EIS was started. Any other findings to date in terms of, I mean, preliminary? That, that's all we can report at this time. Oh, you can report, okay. And for the new jail facilities, there's obviously populations that, like, like female population right now has its own facility. Is the ex expectation that there will be a female, a female unit in every single, woman unit, a woman's unit in every single new jail facility, or will it be, uh, uh, I mean, obviously we're trying to bring people closer to home what is the expectation about specialized units or, in this case, an entire jail facility that's dedicated to a certain population? So keeping with our concern to keep folks in their communities, we would have um, female units in every single one of the new jails. Everyone, everyone. Okay. Thank you. 
And then the barge um, has been a topic of discussion recently around what to do with the, the barge in the Bronx. Is there any, what is the, what is the future hold for the barge? There have been no decisions made about the barges. No as so yet. right now it stays, it's, the plan is to keep it. There hasn't been any decision because the study hasn't been done yet. Okay, so the study will lead to a decision about, will inform a decision about what to do with the barge. It should inform the decision, yes. Okay, and that's November? By the end of the calendar year. By the end of the calendar year, okay. And then we, as part of the state budget, design build was included for a number of projects, something the city council had advocated for and the mayor supported. And um, we have belief that it would have result in some cost savings and some timeline improvements in terms of the new GF facilities. Have you made a decision or determination on how much time and money it would save in terms of construction for the new facilities? Not yet at this time. We're gonna be working closely with DDC throughout that process. And again, the the, um, outcome of the CPSD study will help inform us as to where we can go with cost savings related to design build. Okay, so no, I mean, know oh, that the Limit Commission, I think, had put the current timeline at 6.5 years with design build included. Does that sound in the ballpark, or is that uh, no, no information, no guess on, on what the improved timeline might be? I wouldn't want to guess at that at this time. All right, <laughs> I won't make a guess. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the, just a few more questions. So we have new spending in here, which um, is for investigations division, ESU emergency services, compliance and safety center, and then the cell door replacement, I think are four of the, the big items. The investigations division is 71 new investigators, which I think is a result of the, uh, the, the federal monitors report. Are we, do you expect other additional spending either out of the, the most recent report or other like, what, what, are the, what will be the new, I mean, you can't predict the new needs because of a, a, a that's come out. Is that the only new need that came out of the fifth report? Uh, I, other than, um, yes, uh, other than the, the continued um, interest in the city building a new training academy, but um, this, there's been funding um, for that and we're moving forward. But the uh, investigators, the head count for the investigations division uh, presently stands at about 170, and at the time of uh, the Nunez settlement in 2015, the investigations division was uh, only about 100 investigators. So we've significantly increased the headcount, so we believe with this next tranche of headcount increase in fiscal 19's um, executive budget that uh, we will be able to um, reduce the caseloads sufficiently and see efficiencies due to the merging of the uh, supervision of the investigations and the trials divisions under one deputy commissioner. Another topic of the training academy, I will, I will ask the follow-up question, which is, is there any updates? And is the 100 million, I think I asked this last time, I'm not sure if we got a clear, is the 100 million dollars the expected total amount to complete an academy? That's the um, amount that's been allocated, yes, based on the uh, space um, and um, uh, space, largely the space and the needs requirements um, that the department would have for an academy for So us. that is the estimate about what the, of, the, of the cost of it? Obviously, real, and there's obviously other contingencies in there, but. I, I think it's hard to say without a defined site and location if that will be sufficient. Right, and, time, and timeline update on where the process? The city is actively um, identifying and considering um, uh, potential properties that would um, meet as an initial criteria the, some of the location, um, you know, near public transportation, the size um, uh, requirements, and then from there we'll, um, we'll move forward with um, you know, further review and um, um, the procurement process. And what's the, how many staff are at the academy today? The class size was, I believe, 856, were um, at last count uh, 820 or so. 820 staff? Yes. Oh, you're talking staff. Um, staff. Yeah. Roughly 100. 100. Will you need another? You will, you will need. Will you need with the new academy an increase in your staff budget as well? It's possible that we will need new staff assigned there as we expand the academy into including a leadership development track into our curriculum. Okay, got it. Um, I'm going to a few more questions, and I'll hand it off to back to the chair. Um, we had a hearing last week. Last month on safety and security. We also had um, uh, a, a bill from the speaker 
that relate to the telephone fees, and this has been a topic that's come up in the past as well. Can you um, just update us on, I think it's about $5 million that's projected in terms of telephone fees for, uh, for phone calls. Can you, and, and just for some of the colleagues here as well who, who were not that hearing, can you give us an update on, is, is A, is $5, is $5 million the right number for projected telephone fees? Yes. Okay. And how, did, how does one make that projection? How, explain us, to, can you explain to us the fees that, and the, the telephone calls? And, and so, so how much are they being charged? I think there's some free phone calls and they get charged at a certain point. Can you explain that, 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 uh, that process to us? So the determination of the five million was uh, negotiated with, it's a negotiated contract with a vendor, um, which was registered in 2014. So I can't necessarily speak to how that number was determined. Um, sorry, I need a minute to find the information on the phones. While she looks for the information on the, on the, uh, related to the contract, I can answer some questions about the operations and the phone calls. Sure. So um, uh, all detainees re free, receive free uh, calls uh, in the, uh, during the new admission process, and then further indigent, indigent detainees receive free calls um, three a week as a detainee, two a week as a sentenced um, inmate. Um, they can make, uh, inmates can, and detainees can make additional calls um, in, in a variety of ways, either collect calls where the call is uh, paid for by the uh, receiving party. Um, they can make calls with funds available in their commissary accounts. Um, certain numbers such as 311, the Department of Investigation, um, the PREA hotline uh, calls um, uh, are free. Um, attorney calls are not free, but those calls um, are often um, not paid for either. They're paid for by the, by the receiving party and the attorney. So that's generally the kind of the scope of phone calls. Our, uh, those in our custody make approximately 26,000 phone calls every day, almost 10 million. 26,000 every day? Yes, almost 10 million a year. And what's the cost per call to the, to the, uh, to the caller? So it's 50 cents for the first minute and then five cents for each additional minute. What's the cost of like, if I'm making a phone call from home, what's the, what's the average cost? Oh, I have, I, have no, I have no idea. 50 cents sounds high, doesn't it? Um, I, as, a, as an initial first minute, I think um, uh, considering um, other correction agencies and, and departments nationally, um, I think it's on, it's on the higher side for the first minute, but our per cent, five cent per minute um, cost is uh, lower. And so the average cost of a phone call is, um, is, is moderate compared to um, national average. So in terms of revenue made, so you have, a, you have a contract with, you have a $5 million contract with an outside third party. Who is a third party? Uh, who's the contract with? Securus Technologies. Okay, and that's five. That's a five million dollar contract. It's a five million annual contract. We the department pays. Is it five million? It's a five million dollar revenue contract with Securus Technologies. So they are basically making the money that off the calls that are made. Is that right? It's well. There's five million in revenues in the city's budget. So there's five million. <clears throat> allocated in the city's revenue plan as miscellaneous revenue right. that goes back to the general fund. We do have to pay the vendor for their services as well. Um, how much do we pay the vendor? Roughly, I think it's about three million per fiscal year. I'd have to double check that number. So we're paying three million, we're making five million, and then what's happened to that other two million? It's going into the general fund? Or well, there's other fees. I, I don't want to misspeak, so I, I can get further details on that. When does that contract end? That contract will be expiring in um, March of 2020, although we're going to proceed uh, conversations with the vendor as a result of the legislation yeah. um, that's out um, to see how we can amend. I mean, I think you know where I'm coming from, yes. which is that I think there's a lot of concern amongst colleagues uh, about the, char the charges. And uh, I think the speaker's bill speaks to that concern, certainly from the speaker and some others. So we, we, we would like to have, continue to have a conversation about that. I understand that you are in a, con a contract, you know, but it, it feels like it's uh, a conversation that should, should require, you know, to have some, some urgency related to it. And while we, while I know the, the sort of constraints on an existing contract, certainly 
some way to revisit that. And certainly as you get to the end of it in March 2020, which seems like a far time away, we'd like to, 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 to talk more about that. I want to move to other fees and services. Um, commissary has been, has also received some attention. Um, how, how much revenue are we receiving from commissary on an annual? Approximately 13 million. This year? Yes. And that's revenue, that's, that's. It's same, same, it's, it's miscellaneous revenue into the uh, city's general fund, yes. And uh, who's, we have a, con that's also a contract with an outside. So there's multiple contracts that um, the, although the department holds, they're procured by DCAS as many goods contracts are. Um, so there's multiple contracts, maybe 10, roughly 10 or more, for various goods that we uh, have available for sale in the commissary. I, I should have asked, does, does the agency have an opinion on the bill from the speaker related to the telephone fees, a position on it? Well, with respect to um, the commissary bill, as I understand it. Uh, the first question was, to, I will ask that too, but the first question is a telephone bill. That oh, well, with the, with the phone bill, when we, um, we were here last, our, our, our position remains the same. The city and the Department of Correction are interested in uh, making the phone calls as low cost as possible. Okay, or, but, the, but the low cost, but also I think the other, the other consideration would be to have, to have not just reducing the amount, but to you know, eliminate any revenue genera generating. Oh, so, so yeah, so, so, so both the cost to the, um, to the detainee uh, as, as low cost as possible, and then on the contract side, as Associate Commissioner Lyons stated, the department is actively engaged with um, the city and now um, with our vendor, Securus Technologies, to determine um, how we can either modify the existing contract or um, uh, have a, a, a new procurement um, with a different terms going forward, absolutely. Okay, when do you think, what, what is, what is, is there an expected timeline and when you have a, uh, a some, somewhat of a final answer on when the status of the contract? So we're going, we're, you know, we're having conversations now with the vendor and negotiation as a process, but we're gonna move it as quickly as we can given the importance of, of the bill and an answer that, you know, we need to provide. And a number of, I know a number of city contracts have automatic renewals. Are we, is 2020, them exercising, you know, one year renewal, two year renewal on top of that, and do, does the contract have renewals after that? The contract does have renewal options, but we have the you right have to exercise, to exercise them, the okay. city. Yeah. And then on commissary, uh, I'll ask the same question, which is, uh, you know, Councilman Richards and Adams have put out a bill uh, uh, just the other, just yesterday, Wednesday, and, and you were, I think, response to a concern that about commissary funds being left over. Um, any, any opinion on that, Bill? Yeah, I, as we understand it, the um, the import and the intention of the bill is to um, ensure that those um, who had in our custody had funds in their commissary account um, receive uh, those those funds upon their release um, from our custody, and we are in a complete accord with that. The department is, has processes in place. We are um, presently in, um, increasing the manners in uh, which we communicate that information to the detainees in our custody. Uh, posting, we're going to be posting signs um, identifying the same. When persons are released from our custody, um, the balance of their account up to $100 is provided in cash. Um, anything over $100 is remitted by check. Um, the individual um, just provides the department with the address to which they want that check uh, distributed or mailed to, um, and the check is mailed. Uh, in addition, anyone can return to any of our department facilities and court locations um, and request at the at the window um, the return of their funds. Is there a time period by which you have to go and and retrieve those funds before they? before they are swept back into the general fund or DOC budget? So the requirement is 120 days presently, um, and then um, although as long as the funds still remain within DOC, again, the detainee can return, um, provide their book and case number and their information and receive um, their funds. What do, do you have any understanding of what the common reasons why somebody doesn't retrieve the funds? But just $3.5 million, is there 
a is it the, the amount, the, three is it the mechanism, I just is to, it to quantify the three point five million dollars represents um, about one hundred and eighty thousand persons. So the a relative um, dollar amount obviously could could vary, but I um, I, I I don't know that um, we've done any. Um, survey to determine why those who have left their funds haven't um, collected them, but um, certainly we're aware that um, our obligation and our interest is to make um, persons in our custody, the detainees, absolutely aware of the process and the procedure so that as many people um, who are in our custody reclaim their funds. Uh, okay. And I w one, I know one note in the executive plan, there's a decrease of $82,000 for a citywide phone plan reform. Can you elaborate on what that represents? That was one of several um, citywide savings initiatives uh, implemented by OMB. So as I understand it, uh, do, do it. Who manages the phone plan citywide is going to be reevaluating those agreements, but I can't comment further than that. So it's a do it initiative around citywide for phone every plan. agency around phone? Okay. Um, I'm going to leave it there. I have some follow-up questions, but I'll, I'll hand it back over to, to Chair Drum. Uh, let's go to Councilmember Holden. And we've been joined by Councilmember Steve Matteo. Good morning, Commissioner. Thanks for visiting my district office last week with your wonderful staff. I learned a lot. Thank you again. Um, just have a couple of questions on the Perkins Eastman uh, study. Um, that should be completed by the end of the year. You said it's, it's close to $8 million uh, project? That is correct. Okay. Could you tell, talk about what they're doing in that? Is that, are they doing an uh, environmental impact study? Are they doing any drawings? Are they, are they doing plans? I mean, can you, can you talk to that? Yes, so um, the CPSD, oh, sorry, the CPSD study will cover um, the sites um, for MDC, QDC in Brooklyn, what can be done. It'll uh, look at conceptual design. It will look at envir environmental impact. There'll be community engagement. Um, to name a few of the of the okay and, and also internally. right so they're doing EIS not an EAS they're not doing Correct. an assessment study they're doing an impact study yes. okay good that's 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 more detail so uh, what was the mandate what, were they given a number of um, detainees to house was it five thousand was it just say not, well we have today nine thousand are they looking at that or they just you, you just gave them put four borough-based jails? So I believe that the number that we're um, looking at is 5,000, but with enough swing space to accommodate a shift in population well, over can time. Can you speak to that a bit? You say swings, enough swing space, but is that 7,000, 8,000? 8, 6,000. I'm sorry, I'm being corrected. It was, the number we're looking at is a population of 6,000 plus enough 6,000 6, beds with swing space capability. All right. So. What if there's, there are more, though? What if we don't get down to that six? What happens? They stay on Rikers, is, or uh, we, have, we build more jails? Is, is there anything in that study to say, what if we need more than four? I'm not sure they're going to include that information, but we have had conversations with them about design and the ability to <clears throat> separate different populations and accommodate swings in population over time. And they are also, they're also mandated to actually replicate the programs at Rikers in all the borough-based jails. So that, that's going to take up more space. Obviously, athletic you know, facilities and health facilities, laundry, um, you know, uh, kitchens, and they, they're, they're mandated to do that. So they're not doing an architectural rendering, right? They're just doing feasibility study. That's correct. Okay. All right. And they, and, you're expected to get that in November or December? By the end of the calendar year. By the end year. of the calendar mm -hmm. year, okay. Um, just one other thing on the, the follow-up on the uh, training facility. Um, who, who can we get to kind of put that on the fast track? Who's responsible to try to, is it DDC? Is it who, who's responsible for moving that along? Is it your agency? Um, because we seem to be kind of stuck. You know, it's, it's coordination between DOC and DDC. I'm sorry? Coordination between DOC and DDC. DOC and DDC. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Just to follow up on, on some of the phone call questions as well. So um, for indigent folks who are trying to make a phone call, how long is their phone call? Six minutes? Correct. Six minutes. Three times a week? Correct. How long is the phone call for those who can pay? Uh, the maximum length of a phone call is 15 minutes. 15 minutes? 
So that's double. Uh, and they can call every day or whenever they want? Correct. They can um, so They could call multiple times a day. Um, the phone usage, the maximum phone usage, um, is, um, I, be I believe it's 21 minutes of access uh, phone, phone um, usage every three hours. Every three hours. Yeah. Um, okay, and, and, if, um, and, and to pay for those phone calls, you have to pay with a, with a credit card or put money down. How does that work? For the detainee, it would be funds, if they have funds in their commissary account, it would be the funds in their commissary account. Um, for the other side, which would be the collect calls from the loved ones, it can be prepaid uh, via online, telephone, or you can go to a, a facility. So for the prepaid, if you pay, how, what's the minimum payment for a prepaid? $20. So um, is there a refund available if the um, detainee leaves? Um, and do, is the person who prepaid eligible to get money back? I'd have to, I actually don't have that answer available. I'd have to look into it. Do you have an idea of what's the average payment on those um, prepaid calls? No, I do not. Okay, because it could probably be significant. I'd, I'd like to know that also. Okay. Okay, there's a lot of questions actually that we're going to have to follow up with you on. Mm -hmm. um, and I just have a couple more here. Um, crisis intervention training. In 2015, DOC and health and hospitals have been, um, since 2015, have been implementing a crisis intervention team program. Crisis intervention team training is given to both officers and mental health staff. It entails 40 hours of intensive training. How much does it cost the department to do the 40-hour training, and is this sufficient for adequate crisis intervention training? I don't have that information. There is a um, when staff is sent to training, there is a, on the there's a backfill involved for those persons that are no longer on their post for the span of training. So there may be an overtime cost, but for the actual cost of the training itself, I I don't have that. Okay, so we're going to ask you for that as well. Okay. Follow up. How does the department measure whether the crisis intervention training is effective or not? Um. That's a very good question. Uh, we assess how the officers are responding in the housing units. Uh, when we have lower incident rates, when we have less use of force, when we have less violence indicators in those housing areas, we believe that there's been a transfer of learning. So is there a formal evaluation process of that program? No. Maybe we should do that as well, uh, see how effective we are. Uh, is the goal to eventually have all DOC staff trained in the crisis intervention team? Yes. Okay. What about um, implicit bias training? Are you doing implicit bias training? We have done implicit bias training at the executive and um, management level. We have not gone down to the captains and, and the officers yet. Is there a plan to do that? We will be incorporating that into the leadership development track. Uh, how, how did you, uh, at one time I know you had a you had trained officers at the Museum of Tolerance. Um, actually, I saw the program, it was pretty good, but I don't think that museum exists any longer. Are you doing anything around racial sensitivity, uh, implicit bias now with the officers? Hmm. That may not have been us, it may have been NYPD, but or all may have been COBA. Oh. It was uh, COBA. It was COBA that was doing that. So but I, I can tell you that um, everyone receives training from our EEO office, um, both in the academy and those who are already in service. And how, 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 what type of, how, how long is that training? I believe that's an all-day training, eight hours. So one day, okay. Um, all right, let me go to mental health first aid. In your response to the follow-up letter that we sent you after preliminary, it says that the department began providing the mental health first aid training to uniform staff on September 14 in September 14 and a total of over 9,000 excuse me, over 5,000 DOC uniform staff members have been trained through March 18. Um, the uh, M uh, MHFA is an eight hour course that gives people okay to uh, that gives people the skills um, to help someone who is developing a mental health problem or experiencing mental health crisis. Um, 
Is that eight hour course enough to deal with that or is more training necessary? I think with respect to the, um, that course, that one day course is sufficient. The department has um, several other um, courses that address um, crisis intervention, conflict resolution, de-escalation. Um, in particular, we have a three day uh, training program that more than 3,000 of our uh, recent recruit graduates have gone through and we began rolling out in March with all of our um, in-service staff. So, um, so yes to the, to the content of the mental health first aid, the eight hour training and the content it covers, but we have um, similar overlapping and extending content in other trainings as well. Okay. All right, uh, I think that's it for now. Um, so we'll cover, I said follow up. Okay, uh, Chair um, Powers has some follow ups. Uh, just questions that I realized I didn't, I didn't get to. When you refund the commissary for the over $100, well, let me ask a question. What percentage of folks are, are normally below the $100 that get, that receive the cash and the amount that's above the $100 that receives a check? We'd have to get that information. I don't have that on here. Any, any, okay. I don't want And to. the, what happens if somebody receives a check that doesn't have a checking account? I'm sorry, say that again? What, what happens to the folks that don't have a checking account? Or adolescents who are, may not, I don't know when I had my check, but I don't know what, what who don't, who may not have a checking account. Check, check yeah. cashing establishments where you can cash a check without having an account? What's the normal fee on a check, a check cashing? I, it's I, high. I'm not, I'm not aware. A lot of, it's a lot of money. And I think not, not great actors. Um, I mean, I, I think there's a, uh, let me ask you a question because it struck me that we are giving some folks back a check and many of you are having a checking account and then you do have to rely on something like a check cashing service uh, that has high fees or can have high fees and can take a large, a large amount of that uh, money back from them. The, um, I just wanted to go back to the, the fees again. So I just wanted to clarify, the city's has $5 million in raised in expected revenue from the phone calls, is paying $3 million annually for the service there's a $2 million profit off the, off the contract. Is that shared between the operator and the department, or does that go directly to the department, that $2 million? The, the only thing we intake is the $5 million. You take the five and you pay out the three? Yes. The five is the fees that get that, that collected. The three is what you pay out. Right. So you make a $2 million. This, sound, this is to come up, you, this is, we're making a $2 million spread on the phone calls in a, you know, uh, today. This, this year we're expected to make a $2 million profit essentially off of the phone calls. We're, again, we're not making the profit. We only intake the five million, so I'd want to research this further so I can you know, give a more informed answer as to what that difference is and why it, is, it exists. What am I, sorry, I might be wrong, but what am I wrong about? We're paying, we're, we're paying three, making five? I'm, I didn't, I, I, again, I just, I recognize you're identifying this two million, but I don't want to misspeak and guess as to what that might be, so I want to be able to research okay. it to give a, an informed answer that's accurate. Okay, and then last question, and uh, vending machines, do we make, what's the expected revenue this year for vending? I, I don't have that available. And uh, you know, okay, so can you get us that? Is it okay if you, and we have a contract with somebody for vending. Do we know how much that contract is annually? We'll get that information to you. That would be great, I appreciate it. And um, I assume all these contracts are like registered with the city controller and everything anyway, right? Yes. So we, um, can you, is, are we, are those available for us to, to have copies of the contracts as well? Um, sure, we can, uh, information is always available via the controller's checkbook, but we could also, you know, obtain that information for you if you want to see the details of the contract. Yeah. Okay, and then the, I, I'm sure you saw it today on the city controller's report that raised some concerns. Any, any, I don't, it was, it was minutes before we all walked in the door, but any initial feedback on the controller's report this morning? I have not seen that report yet. I'm sure it's on your desk when you get back to, <laughs> I'm sure uh, it will be. Uh, I, mean, I think it raises concerns about 
the drop in population, but the continued increases in spending, particularly around personnel and overtime and headcount. I won't ask you to respond to it because you haven't had a chance to look at it. Thank but you. So, you know, something we'll, we may ask about in the future. Uh, that's it. Great. Mm -hmm. And uh, not, at some point in the future, also, I, I would like to talk with you um, about the, um, the increase, it seems to me, in the um, request for variances on segregated uh, housing and, uh, and have a discussion with you around that, but that's not what today is about. So what we're gonna do right now, I think, is that we're gonna close out and thank you for coming in, and we look forward to continuing to work with you on these issues. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, thanks for being here. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, this concludes our hearing for today. This Finance Committee will resume executive budget hearings for fiscal 2019 on Monday, May 14th, 18, at 10 a.m. in this room. On Monday, the Finance Committee will hear from the New York Police Department, the District Attorneys, and the Special Narcotics Prosecutor, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, the Department of Housing and Preservation and Development, and the Department of Buildings. Thank you, and this hearing is now adjourned. <laughs>